How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today, I have a special guest, my friend Matt, and we're talking about truth absolutism. So I think it was about, what, a year ago that we first talked about having this conversation. Uh, I think you came up to me and said that you wanted to do that because you were talking with a friend of yours about a, a clip from Destiny. So can you explain the background behind that? Yeah. So, um, thanks for having me on and everything. Um, yeah. so yes, yeah, so I was just watching destiny on YouTube one day and he was having a conversation with somebody else. I can't really remember who it was right now, but I've seen them made the same comment multiple times. Um, where he was just talking and he just said, he's not a truth absolutist. He is a truth relativist that I've never heard someone just out and out say that before. So I sent the clip to a friend of mine and I was like, lol, man, this is so ridiculous. And my friend messaged back to me, Matthew, I'm also not a truth absolutist. And oh, I was girl. absolutely floored. This friend of mine is incredibly intelligent, incredibly you know, successful in his field. He's getting a PhD in physics, which made it even more odd to me that he said this because his whole job is the pursuit of truth and using the scientific method to try to come up with answers. Right. And for, I've known this kid my whole life and for some reason, despite the fact that we have the same socioeconomic background, we both come from two parent households. We grew up a handful of miles away from each other went to the same schools, had most of the same teachers. Again, he was a little bit more advanced classes than I was. Um, he is a pretty hardcore socialist, and I'm a pretty hardcore conservative. And it's always questioned in my mind, like, what could have happened along the road that led us to such different paths? And I believe that it comes down to this question of... For me to believe something, I need to know hard evidence that it is true. Can you define hard evidence? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, a little bit hard to define because in the realm of, you know, like we know each other through church. Um, so that's theology, but also philosophy and, and politics in general. You can't exactly apply something like the scientific method. But the scientific method is a great way to show hard evidence. Um, right. But anything that you can show a repeated end result with the same input, I think, could be shown to be true. Um, okay. So something that's repeatable? Yes. Re and measurable? Measurable. Observable okay. is probably so the biggest question. That's sounding like logical positivism, which says that the only true things are those that are measurable and repeatable. Are you saying that that's the position you take or the position that your friend was taking? Uh, I think that's the position I take. Again, I've this is the first I've heard of that philosophy, but I mean... It's just from... a label. Yeah, from the quick yeah. explanation, it sounds about right to me. Okay, so how does that differ from what your friend believes, where he says the truth is relative? So my friend believes is actually much more of a utilitarian belief that, you know, there is such thing as truth, but if that truth is getting in the way of human happiness, then it should be put aside in exchange for this thing that will theoretically create more human happiness. Um, okay. So like you know, Sam Harris says. Yes. Um, I guess okay. the human flourishing the quickest and shortest example we could probably do is something like the trans thing, right? My friend knows that this person is a biological male, mm -hmm. but he also understands that this person wants to be seen as a female. So just by ignoring the truth and calling them a female, that makes that person happy. For okay. me, that seems wrong. It seems like a moral ill 
to put that person's happiness over something that we could know for fact is true. Okay. So now we're getting into the realm of morality. That seems to kind of clash with both of your positions, though, I think, just from what you said. Okay. So uh, from your friend's perspective, if everything is relative, or at least if truth can be set aside for what's, you know, what makes people happy or whatever, well, who gets to decide, you know, whose happiness wins out? That's a question we need to ask. So we can discuss that in a second. But you also, at least the first thing you said was kind of like you assented to the idea of logical positivism. Um, I know that you don't believe the only things that are real are material things since you're a Christian. So the logical positivist position would uh, clash with Christianity. So do you think that truths can exist outside of the material world? Yes. And okay. so that I would say, A, I think I've had observable evidence of God um, in my okay. own personal life. I imagine you would as well. I would also say that there is, this is why I said, you know, it doesn't always have to be some sort of scientific method, but there are, I think, observable evidences that such, at least something like the Proverbs as taught in the Bible, you know, the point of the Proverbs was the art of good living. And if you followed mm -hmm. the things in the Proverbs, you will repeatedly have a good life. Um, right. So that's not. They're, they're like general truths, not absolute truths, right? Yes, they're general truths, and you can't exactly then extrapolate that, that therefore God is real, but you can extrapolate that the Bible is teaching truths, and the Bible okay. says God is real, and right. therefore I think that is a evidence towards God. Um. I can't prove God is real. If I could, I'd be the richest um, theologian in the world, but it's... Okay, so that's interesting. When you say prove, what do you mean? When you say you can't prove that God is real, you mean you can't, like, provide some incontrovertible evidence or something like that? Exactly. I can't... I can provide a plurality of evidence towards God's reality, but I think inherent to the Christian faith is you have to have faith at the last little bit. You have to take okay. that last step into the unknown. And then by, you know, my experience and most Christians I've known, once you get on this side of it, you do see even more evidence that you were, that God was real the whole time. But mm -hmm. you start making those connections, you know, God does not fully reveal himself to us before become to faith um okay so going back to your friend and the conversation that you guys had uh tell me more about the different position that you think he takes and how that would affect his worldview um i would say i guess the worldview part of the worldview that he takes is that humans are kind of the highest being or power right um versus i believe in a higher power and so i believe truth is a set defined thing defined by god um right versus he you know believes truth is a thing that we can define we can observe we can measure um but if that truth then comes into conflict with humans or our happiness or our, you know, even if we said our flourishing, right? Even if we said there was hypothetically somewhat thing that by ignoring the truth, it actually did lead to more human flourishing, which I don't believe that would exist because I don't believe God would set up a system like that. But let's okay. say that hypothetically there was. I would still believe because there is a higher power to find truth in that way, we should ignore it. Um, 
and we should focus on what God is saying is true. Okay. So if somebody just comes along and says, uh, this is now what's true because I said so, uh, and I, you know, I think it makes more people happy. We shouldn't just immediately take what they say to be true. You're saying uh, we should, you know, judge it against God's standard. Yes, I do. I think this is okay. the, the classic two plus two equals five, right? From 1984. Right. Um, so even if, you know, in that world, the government got everyone to agree two plus two equals five, it just was untrue and therefore was still wrong. Mm -hmm. um, just it's it's that everybody believes it but yeah that doesn't make it true it doesn't make it true right um, so have you talked to your friend about that like if he if you were to ask him something like hey you're a physicist you you talk about truth in some sense as part of your job could you just believe that physics works differently and then suddenly it works differently like do you get to define the laws of the universe? I have not asked him that question. Um, I probably should. And I wonder, it'd be very interesting to hear his answer because I had another conversation with him that I thought was very interesting where he basically proposed a hypothesis that the entire universe is one enormous mathematical equation. Um, oh, that's new. I don't know if you've heard this. So mm -hmm. this idea comes out of, have you heard of chaos theory? Um, I've heard the name. I haven't looked into it. So chaos theory is most often used in weather because the idea came from a weatherman. And it's a really funny okay. story. So the weatherman has this computer that could calculate out to however many digits. Mm -hmm. But he had a printer that could only calculate out to one less digit. And so okay. he's typing up all of his calculations, trying to make the weather report for that week, hits print, gets his paper. Then he's like, oh, I should double check my math. Enters the value that the printer gave him, which was one decimal short. So like, mm -hmm. let's say it was to the millionth place. It only gave him the hundred thousandth place. Okay. And all of a sudden, rather than having a nice sunny day, he was predicting like a tornado in the area. And... This is where chaos theory came from. The idea that very, very infinitesimally small variables cause massive changes in the outcome. The classic saying is the wing beat in India causes the typhoon in the Philippines. Okay. Um, That's kind of reminding me of the, the whole butterfly effect thing like yeah. if you were to go back in time you step on a butterfly and suddenly the whole world explodes 2000 years later or something like that yeah the butterfly effect comes from chaos theory okay well okay. so then if you take that the other direction and you apply this idea well then anything could be modeled mathematically you would just need a you know infinite sized computer to do all the calculations for you to calculate all of reality. And he told me this one time and I just kind of laughed because I was like, well, that's just God. That's um, what I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. And we actually have this idea from John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. That word pathos could also be truth. Um, John is writing this because at the time in Turkey, Turkey was dominated by the Greek school of thought. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had Socrates, who Socrates is the one who posed the question of, I know nothing. And so he's like, I'm just going to start asking questions. And Socrates believed that, you know, if I want to learn how to bake, I go ask a baker questions. But then he was unhappy because he kept asking the bakers questions and they kept not having the truth of baking because they didn't you know, understand it. They just baked. Did it. Yeah. Yeah. So Plato okay. took, took his teacher's Socrates idea and he expanded it. And he said, all right, well, if I can learn the truth of baking by asking questions, 
then I could learn the truth of everything by asking even more questions. And that is what was just happening in the ancient world at the time in Turkey and Greece, was philosophers were just asking a lot of questions. So John comes in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, and says, hold up, guys. I'll save you guys so much trouble and time, and I'll just give you the answer. Here's the answer. If you ask all the questions for all of time, you'll end up at the truth that the God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were there at the beginning of time, and they create everything. Okay. Well, John 1, 1 just men mentions the word, which is Jesus. He doesn't mention the spirit yet, right? Right, but, but I'm a Trinitarian. In the Bible, you get there. Yeah. Right, right. And it, okay. it says the word, but the Greek word for word there is pathos. I thought it was logos. Oh, it is logos. You're right, it is logos. But logos also means truth. Pathos okay. is... Pathos is something else. I don't know my Greek, but... yeah. I'm tracking. Clearly, okay. clearly, I don't know my Greek either. Um, <laughs> so, how does this relate to the math thing that your friend was talking about? Well, it was a very interesting comment to me that he made that two thousand years later, physicists are doing the exact same thing. They are also trying to map out the entire world. You know, just create enough equations, ask enough mm -hmm. questions, and get an answer. And um, to me, that answer is still just God. Yeah. I I don't think your friend is being very introspective because he seems to be holding two different things, two different contradictory things at the same time, where he thinks if he can just ask enough questions, he can eventually reach the truth, and maybe there's this big math equation instead of what we think of as God. But at the same time, he's willing to throw truth under the bus if it makes people happy. Yeah, I, again, I would agree with you. Um, this incongruency seems odd to me. It seems, I don't know how you arrived to that. I don't know how a person arrives to that conclusion, but it seems to me that a lot of people have. And yes. I believe that is what is missing in a lot of, you know, these debates, right, where we have talking head one and talking head two, and they go on TV and they don't really do anything and gets lots of ratings or clips or whatever. Right. And I think that comes from, at its core, we can both look at the same thing. But if we have wildly different ways of looking at things, it's not, the answer will just be completely different. Right. Yeah, it's about the presupposition that you have going into the conversation, what you assume coming in, right? If you assume truth is absolute and your friend assumes truth is relative and you're looking at the same problem, you're, you're probably going to have different answers. Yes. Um, okay, so this is kind of a common issue in my realm when I'm doing apologetics uh, because presuppositions like we just discussed will color people's uh, worldviews and the, and the answers they come to. How do you see or do you see a way to kind of bridge the gap with people? Or do you think they're, you know, the, the relativist and the absolutist are entirely separate and you can't bridge a gap between them in a conversation and find common ground? I think... It would be the case that a relative and absolutist would be so far apart that they would be incapable of having a conversation. Okay. But I think the reality is most people have my friend's contradiction in mind where they, I think God gives us a desire in our hearts for truth. And then I think mm -hmm. some of us might come or some people might come to conclusions that you don't need to be a truth absolutist, but really deep down, they still are. That still yearning is inside of them, okay. even if they tried to ignore it. And so I think if you're having an apologetic conversation and someone is, you know, being wishy-washy and they're trying to hide behind, 
you know, flexibility in the truth, I think you would point out to them that you don't act like a truth relativist. You know, we all operate in daily life under Descartes. I think therefore I am right. We all know we're real, but if you followed truth relativist to the end, you would be incapable of knowing that you were real. There's a friend of mine who did a, he did a uh, testimony video with a friend of his recently on his channel. His name is Christian Gadfly. And he said um, he had a stint as an atheist. And he got to the point where he was depressed to find out that he didn't exist. <laughs> yes. Where he, yeah. reached, he reached the logical conclusion that he did not exist. And it made him sad. Yes, that, that I think is a very common thing to happen. Yeah. Um, because if you can't trust your own eyes, then what can you do? You really mm -hmm. do just have to give Take up and guess. yeah, just, just, there's, there's no answer and that hurts us. I think there is in you know, the same drive in all of us to, to learn to discover something new. Yeah. Um, that's what drives it, scientific processes. Exactly. What do you think about this? I've been thinking about this related as it relates to politics, because, you know, we're coming up on the election and everything. Um, sometimes people seem to vote for policies that are harmful, but they're harmful to other people and not to the, the person who's voting for it. So I'll give you an example. I live in a place that is relatively affluent. There's a lot of uh, retired people who live near me and, you know, they've got lots of money. They've moved from some other state to come here. And we also live nowhere near the southern border of the United States. And they'll vote for things like having an open border. But I was thinking about this, and I, trust me, it gets back to the conversation. I'll, I'll bring it around. Um, I think that they're voting for things like that because there's an emotional appeal for like an asylum seeker or something like that. But more importantly, they can afford to vote for that. So if they lived in, I don't know, southern New Mexico and were threatened by some people coming over the border, they probably wouldn't be voting for open borders. But since they live far away from it in an area that's relatively unaffected by it, they can vote for it because they can afford it. So as that concept relates to the whole truth conversation, like with your friend, I'm wondering, do you think he holds the relativist position when he does because he can just afford to do so in that time of his life? Like it's not going to negatively affect him to say that truth is relative? And I can expand on that more if you want me to. No, I understand the, yes, I think you are hitting something on the head. I think um, for, again, my, my friend is very smart. He is very logical. Mm -hmm. But I think many issues hit an emotional side. And it really, the, especially the, the illegal immigration conversation does hit a very emotional side. Um, okay. You were probably not a member of the church at the time, but we had a major thing. I remember where were you ever on the Appalachian mission trip that we do? Um, mm, no, I wasn't. Okay. So we used to do that every year and we used to have a member of our church who was Hispanic who was like a handyman. And so he went every single year. He was very hardworking. He would usually lead teams that would help rebuild people's houses. And then we get back from an Appalachian mission trip one year and he tells us that he was an illegal and that he had been living with this the entire time. And it wow. was eating him up inside. Yes. Again, we were all heartbroken because he was such a member of the church mm -hmm. and so close to all of us. But he told us he's going to go, 
that he was going to live by you know, his beliefs and his morals and the truth, which was the fact that he was not supposed to be in this country. And he actually went back to Mexico. He then had a very difficult process, but did refile all of his paperwork um, and then sought asylum. So yes, it is a very emotional, it's a very human thing. You know, I think it's right for us all to feel bad for the asylum seekers in this way, but we have to make policies based off of concrete evidence. Mm-hmm. And not on feelings. Exactly. I agree with the idea of making um, policies off of facts and not emotions, but people are also emotional beings. And I don't I don't think we can entirely unhitch ourselves from our emotions. So to bring it back to the conversation you're having with your friend, do you think there's some kind of emotional aspect of aspect of playing into that, even though he's, you know, supposed to be this unbiased physicist or whatever? Yeah, I think, um, I think we all are on some times in some levels ruled by our emotions. Um, But I think that's why we need things like higher authorities. And on, mm. you know, a short t- term, you know, if we're talking about an immigration policy, we should listen to the experts on the southern border. If we're discussing sure. food, health, and safety, right, we should listen to the experts in those areas. And then in a broader how we live our life sense we should listen to in my opinion the ultimate authority god and in a lot of times if you listen to him you get answers to those other things too um funny enough because he's the guy who has set everything into place and right. has made it the way that things are the source of truth yes so how do you how do you reach a friend like that who's uh would you say he's a socialist? Do you yes. think he's a postmodernist too? Well, I guess he kind of would be because postmodernism is like post truth, yes. relativism, that kind of stuff. I would assume okay. he is. I've never asked him specifically about that, but okay. I will, uh, just because I know we both listen Jordan Peterson, I've had a number of conversations about art, and I'll send him sometimes like really ugly stuff, and then. He's like, no, but if you just look at it through this lens, it's amazing. So, Can you give me an example? Um, I sent him a fashion show. Uh, basically just like, why does this stuff always just look so bad? It was the one, you probably heard about it, where they had the models like walking through a construction site and they got like horribly muddy and they were all very angry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. Yeah. So I sent it to him, and <laughs> I was we had a, I can find that. Keep talking. We had a whole conversation about why do fashion designers, when we all know what really looks good, right? I mean, we've been making clothes for thousands and thousands of years. We all right. know that suits look good on men and dresses look good on women, and you know, but then every year. The people who get paid to make clothing try to do this weird stuff. And he responded that, well, sometimes you learn more by making something wrong than you do making it right. And he used an engineering question mm-hmm. of by taking a material that we know cannot do a job. And we push it to breaking point. We learn more about the material itself than if we only used materials exactly as they're supposed to be used. Um, you know, he used the every engineering student does the bridge challenge where you make it the balsa wood bridge and then you fill it up with right. sand until it breaks. Um, the whole challenge there is to put, we know how much weight balsa wood can hold. So we're going to intentionally put too much weight on it 
just to see the thing break and see what we can learn from that. Do you think the same, do you think your friend would apply that same principle with morality and big moral issues? Um, like for example, would he say we'd learn more from uh, committing a murder than we would from obeying the law and not committing a murder? Or we'd learn more from stealing from a store about yeah. stealing than obeying the law and not stealing from the store. Do you think he'd say the same thing? Or do you think that's kind of a a hard line in the sand that he'd draw? I think he would say that we would learn more, but that we shouldn't have so, like who's going to be the murder victim right um at some point you're going to hurt hmm. somebody but if there okay. was a way to do this experiment without hurting a person then we should do the experiment to learn more but it's a murder <laughs> but it is a murder <laughs> like that's gonna the, hurt a person yes that is the the reason yeah. that it is wrong hmm. um okay well okay then how do we parse that out that now we're talking about uh, making people happy and not hurting anybody, but he would probably also say that there's applications where pain can be a good teacher. Like if you press, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you're going to learn a lot about not putting your hand on a hot stove again. Cause it hurts. That's painful. That doesn't make somebody happy. Uh, it hurts people yet. It turns out to be a good thing. I mean, again, now we're, I'm trying to speak for another person and I can't exactly do right. that, but we could just have this conversation yeah. about, yeah, we both know that pain in certain circumstances can be good. You know, mm -hmm. but touching the hot stove means that you don't one day, you know, fall into an oven or a fire or, you know, you get a little bit of pain now and it right. prevents you from you know, ultimately Smart destroying yourself. Fire. Yeah. Some other time. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what your friend would say to something like that, because if he would be, if his standard of what is true and good is something that doesn't hurt other people, but we can give an example of something that would hurt somebody and yet still end up being good, then his worldview is inconsistent and he needs to pick another worldview. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I and mean, I would agree with that, um, which is, again, why I don't hold his worldview. Because um, right. I've seen those I've seen those things in my own life where someone told me something and then, you know, I assume they didn't know what they're talking about. I'm going to do it my own way. But, you know, my betters had had the evidence mm. and what they said was true. And then, you know, I think this comes back to Solomon's great experiment, right? He's like, oh, I have two options here. I can either A, just listen to what God tells me, or B, I can use all my power, all my resources, all my life to run the great experiment. And right. then I'm ultimately a pretty miserable person at the end of it. Um, and I could save myself some misery if I just listened to my betters. Uh, do you think your friend's aware of the difference between um, informational knowledge and experiential knowledge? I'm sure he is. Okay. I think people are, are generally aware of that, but maybe they, you know, if you don't explain it to them, they're not really thinking about that. So informational knowledge would be somebody telling somebody else, you know, don't touch the stove because it's hot and you're going to get hurt. Experiential knowledge is the actual going and touching the stove and realizing for yourself that it actually is hot. So you can take the informational knowledge or the experiential knowledge, which will get you to the same point. Uh, but one of them involves pain and experience and the other one doesn't, or at least to a lesser degree. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's what, you know, if we want to talk about, again, a big idea of like, what should we do as a country in this election and everything? That's why I'm a more conservative person because it might be true that there is, 
you know, some socialist policy that would create a bunch of human flourishing. But I believe the, the road to get there would be so disastrous and have so many failures that would negatively hurt people's lives that it's mm. not worth running some great experiment with the country. I mean, this is, this is what FDR said when he was making his new deal was um, rapid experimentation. He was looking for answers than playing games with people's lives. And I think, yeah, I think we all can agree that there is an inherent value in a life and that we shouldn't, if you have well, authority, well, we can I get to that. that we, would. <laughs> we can get to that conversation. Yeah. If you have an authority you should only make decisions based off of what you know to be true because you're risking other people's lives. Right. But see, that kind of goes back to the thing I was talking about a minute ago with someone being able to afford to make a decision like that. So it, to go back to the, the border thing, somebody that lives where we live doesn't have to deal with what they're dealing with in Colorado right now, where some apartment buildings are taken over by Venezuelan gangs from well, from Venezuela. Um, if we vote for something that would allow more Venezuelan gangs in the country, right now, we don't have to deal with that, so it doesn't affect us, but we're playing games with somebody else's life because they're getting ousted from their uh, apartment complexes by these gangs in Colorado. Like that's happening right now. That's an um, insane story. Yeah. yeah I, it is. I actually thought it was clickbait the first time I read it. I uh, know, right? Oh, Venezuelan gangs in Colorado. Yeah, sure, buddy. No, it's, it's actually happening. There's yes. a video of it happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Um, that's exactly right. That is what we should all be considering when we consider how much authority and what kinds of authority we choose to give to the state and what kind of mm -hmm. policies we support is not just how does this affect me today in the short term, but how does this affect both my neighbor, my extended neighbor, because we're supposed to be one big country, but also even my children or my grandchildren. Um, I think that's what you see a lot with welfare programs that again, FDR created is that they were created with the best of intention and they may have even helped support people at the time, but now they're fostering communities of laziness, communities of, you know, not self-reliance. Why mm -hmm. should I burden myself with this when I know that I can have a state take care of it? Right. And I was actually watching a video the other day talking about losing your, your job is one of the few things that people, but more simply men, cannot recover from. Um, you know, we've, they've done the experiments where they give a person the lottery or they have someone be a like quadriplegic, right? And then they okay. come back a year later and both people have the same level of happiness in their lives um we as people mm -hmm. are able to recover from really dramatic experiences it's but one of the few things that men cannot recover from is losing their jobs but then we have social welfare programs that incentivize not returning to work after you get you lose your job and those programs something when you say something you can't recover from, what do you mean? Like, like their, their quality of life does not spring back. Okay. Um, they have continuous levels of depression, alcoholism, uh, I see. Uh, suicidal ideations, you know, these things that other traumatic events have in the short term, but over a long period of time, they go away. Um, so you're saying, you're saying, in the case of somebody that loses their job, a guy who loses his job and doesn't yet have another job, he can't just come back to the same level of happiness that he had while he had a job? Yes. Versus okay. like the quadriplegic, yeah, yeah. when they wake up and they're like, you're paralyzed, their first thought is probably going to be, I should just die. But sure. as they 
live life as a quadriplegic, eventually they get to a place of, no, I'm, I want to live. I want to see right. my life through. Right. But that does not happen with men who do not work. Men who okay. lose a job yeah, and then prolonged. have prolonged unemployment. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we have Did policies you... that incentivize this prolonged unemployment. Did you know that the most common word used in suicide notes is the word useless? I did not know that, but... But it, it tracks, it, right? It, yeah, it seems like pretty much the number one reason that you would consider taking your own life is if you didn't feel like you, you had a purpose. place in this world and you had a use. Right. So to bring that back to where we started this conversation, um, your friend mentioned that humans are the highest power or the highest uh, authority as to what is good. You know, we can choose what is good or what is true in our lives. But humans, and this has been shown throughout history, also can choose to say that other people are useless and not worth living. We've seen that. We see that every day. You know, every time somebody kills another person, they think you're not worthy of living. You you don't have a purpose. The best thing for you is to die. Um, how do you think your friend would view the the state of men in our country and the future of men in our country, where we see so many people uh, being suicidal at the very least? because they don't feel like they're useful. Do you think he's, do you think because of the postmodernism that we have in our country, your friend would say we're trending in a good direction or a bad direction? Uh, I've had this conversation with him, not in this context, but mm -hmm. again, it's an, I feel another contradiction, his philosophy, because he feels like we're trending in a bad direction and he knows why. And we, and he and I agree on this. The reason why is, we've lost community in this country. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't feel useless if you know you're a member of a so like a social, for us, it's Hierarchy. church, right? Like, you know, right. we know that no matter how bad things might get out of work or, you know, social media or whatever thing you value, when you can go to church every Sunday and see the same people and, they all value you there. You don't feel that. So he right. knows, and I know this, that the breakdown of community and the social, you know, clubs or like, like social clubs we used to have in this country a lot back, mm -hmm. um, like the Rotary Club or the, uh, the Lions Club. Like the I Lions think. Club. Yeah. Lions yeah. Club. Mm -hmm we used to have those as adults and everyone's asking the same question. It's like, all right. So as a kid, I have all these social programs. I do boy scouts, choir, sports, sports, whatever. And I find my value there. And then I graduate college. I go to the real world and I have nothing. <laughs> and if yeah. I, you're isolated, you're isolated. And so he knows that that's the problem, but mm. He doesn't see what, or at least the way I see it, that it's been the state's constant encroachment into personal lives that has moved people away from those social cohesions. Um, specifically, yeah, if you're asking the state for assistance, you're not asking your neighbor for assistance, and that used to be a way that we could, like, if you had someone who lost their job. And for an extended mm -hmm. period of time, I know this for a fact because we had someone at our church who lost a job for like 19 months, like wow. the, the sole breadwinner of his family Jeez. for 19 months lost his job. And every single Sunday he came to church and said, Hey guys, I need help with this. I'm still struggling to find this job. Mm -hmm. And the church was able to come around him and, you know, he never went on welfare or took disability or those types of things, but we supported wow. him and now he's living a great fruitful life. He has another job and that used to be how we did things. But now, you know, it is hard to ask for help from 
your neighbor, but it's very mm -hmm. easy to ask help from some random government employee mm -hmm. person. Right. And by making it easier, you incentivize people to do it more often. Even if that person does understand how this is really killing them inside. Yeah. They're making lives, their life worse for themselves without really knowing it. Um, okay. So to bring this around to the topic that we started with, well, I kind of already said that, but in a different way, uh, how does this relate to people's conception of the truth? And what do you think can, what do you think we can do about that? I think we can first off show everyone that at the end of the day, we, we do have a desire and an understanding of what truth versus untruth is. And if you can start from there, you can start showing them a better worldview um, that mm -hmm. I believe leads to ultimately more happiness by measuring decisions based off what we know to be true and what we don't know to be true. So actually accepting that there is an objective truth. Yes. Do you see our country being more uh, open to that idea going forward? Do you think more people are coming on board with that? Or do you think people are still moving away? I think people are moving away because I believe that truth can often be difficult or upsetting or, okay, yeah. um, you know, the, the, you've heard of Chesterton's fence. Yes. Um, uh, explain it for people who don't. So if you don't know, Chesterton's fence is one of the, the classic philosophical questions where you are a person just walking in the woods. And one day you just come upon the fence and the fence goes in the complete direction. Either way, mm -hmm. what do you do? Um, the breakdown has been more conservatively minded. People usually turn around and go figure out why that fence or assume that fence is there for a reason and maybe go find out what the reason is right. more liberally minded people or leftist minded people usually see, assume the fence is pointless and either jump it or remove it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great example of truth. The fence is inconvenient. Right. It's in your way. You want to be on the other side, but maybe it has a purpose. Maybe someone who knew more than me has set up that fence the way that it is for my own good. And I believe that's yeah. what God does for us every single day. Maybe there's a pack of ravenous wolves on the other side of the fence that you don't know about. Exactly. And the fence is protecting you. Yeah, you don't know. So yeah. maybe you should go and figure out why. Yeah. Yeah. The same, like you said, the same works for God. Before modern society breaks down and destroys and casts out the idea of God, maybe we should figure out why we have that idea in the first place. But... That truth is inconvenient. Yes. Definitely. I think truths are often inconvenient. Yeah. Well, I think that'd be a good place to wrap that up. Final thing I think we could say is, as Christians, we think people should find God because that's our, our standard of truth. Um, and that will eventually turn society around for the better and lead to more happiness, even if there's struggles and difficulties in the near term because truth is hard to deal with but it leads to good things in the end yes uh, i fully agree with that and i think the more people we can teach that to ultimately the better for everybody 